thank you everyone for coming. We have a, our illustrious panel here. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, fan, engagement, fan engagement strategies and how uh, everybody's dealing with them from a league perspective and a cultural perspective. So I'm going to start off by introducing Jill Gregory first. Jill is a Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer at NASCAR. She oversees all of marketing efforts, including brand marketing, social media, insights and analytics. Uh, Jill joined NASCAR in 2007 when she was the SVP of Motorsports Marketing at Bank of America. So thank you, Jill, for joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks for having me. Uh, next is Alfredo Bermeo. He is the new head of digital strategy at La Liga where he leads all their efforts in developing integrated strategies across La Liga digital platforms, including social media, media, apps, gaming, and other platforms. Alfredo has over 10 years in sports experience, and uh, he just came from leading the media partnerships at Facebook. So thank you, Alfredo, for joining us from Madrid. Thank you. Next, we have Matthew Senadella, Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer for Women's Tennis Association, WTA, where he is, has a multifaceted role, including integrated marketing, digital management, strategic planning, member, and member relations. Matt joined WTA in 2010 from IMG Worldwide, where he was their global controller. So Matt, thank you for joining us from beautiful St. Petersburg. Thank you, Anthony. And last, but definitely not least, we have Noah Garden from uh, MLB. Major League Baseball, Executive Vice President uh, for Business, where he works directly with all the national MLB partners, oversees sponsorships, corporate sales, consumer product licensing for MLB Advanced Media, MLB Properties, and MLB Network, as well as all of their commerce, ticketing, advertising, and subscription businesses. Wow, how do you have time to even be here? <laughs> Um, so Noah joined MLB in 2001 from Outpost.com, where he was Director of Product Marketing and Business Development. Noah, thank you for making the far commute from Chelsea, New York. Thanks for having me. So, so our conversation today is, is, is focused on fan engagement. Uh, we would love to have your perspectives on how you guys have solved some of the different challenges that engaging fans in today's digital world. Um, brings to the table and how, how you go about harnessing some of that fan passion that is so prevalent across sports. Mm -hmm. So we'll start off with a question for Matt and Noah. Uh, it's essential for any sports organization to have both a digital and a social strategy. Tell us a little bit about how those are different and how you guys are approaching those from yeah. a different angle. I mean, for us, we're, we're certainly, thank you, good afternoon. Um, we're certainly at an interesting point on the digital and social side at the WTA. Uh, you know, at, as the governing body, we still have to report through all of our digital channels, the email, dot com, any of our corporate communication side, you know, the scores, the stats, and the insights that come from our you know, 2,000 matches over 300 days every year. Um, and what we find is that our social uh, really has to somehow be able to unify our global audience and be able to provide the behind the scenes aspects that really the casual or even the diehard fan uh, tend to gravitate towards. So for us, we're investing heavily uh, on the social side in our content production and really trying to make sure that everything we do social eventually uh, is driving people through the, through the uh, digital ecosystem. And how is that different in baseball, Noah, since you have a high frequency of games and... You know, I, I don't think it's much different. I think that if you look at overall strategy, it's part of the overall plan. I think that when you talk about each channel, whether it's social or traditionally digital, you know, you're just talking to a different audience. And you know, the goal there is there's some people that spend you know, hours at a time in their social environment. And the question is, how do you reach that individual? And what do you reach that individual with? And so what we try to do is just be respectful of their time if they, that they are spending with us. And if it's a score that, they're want, that they want, or if it's a, a highlight from a game or something that's happened that night, we want to make sure we get it out to those folks that are you know, on social at the right time. Because it, it could be that, that they never come to our site. It could be that that's where they spend you know, all their time increasingly, certainly from millennials. Yeah, so social has definitely accelerated the um, timing of where you need to get messages out to folks. So Jill, and this is for Jill and Alfredo. So nobody really likes to be targeted as a, as a marketing, you know, 
Um, well, no one likes to be a fan that's targeted from a marketing standpoint. How do you guys feel um, is the most effective way to get your brand across and elevate your brand at the same time don't make the fans feel like they are a target of a marketing campaign? Well, I think the, the good news for all of us is that they're fans. That means they're fans of our sport. And you know, our brands come through in all of those competitive elements. So if our fans come to either our digital or social channels, we want to make sure that they're getting the content and um, you know, all of the passion and the excitement of our sport. The great news is our fans are also very open to sponsorship and partnership messages. So we don't have to hit them over the head with a sponsorship or partner message. We can show them the highlights of our sport and customize that based on which platform they're on, um, how much time they have to Noah's point. Um, and the marketing message, if you will, is embedded in that content. So I don't think it's really an either or where we're targeting them with a certain message everything that we do is meant to drive their passion and the marketing comes through that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, con content is the key. It's how you uh, are able to deliver relevant content to the relevant audience, whether you are in China, United States, or Spain, and you follow a com global competition like La Liga, NASCAR, or, or MLB, or, or WTA, how, how you can provide that relevant content that is authentic and, uh, and engage with the fund. I think that that's the key to to uh, have a social social media strategy that is not perceived as, as a marketing uh, targeting. So, Joe, to add on your point there, how do you achieve the balance then with reaching out? During race weekend, obviously, everybody has a thirst or a higher thirst for your content. How do you, how do you achieve the balance when it's not race weekend, but it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and... So you mentioned in the intro that we have a new analytics and insights group. It's not really new, almost a year old. But everything that we do is rooted in insight and what do the fans want. We listen to them, um, both on the digital and social side, each and every day after every race for us. We're asking them how they felt about the competition, what happened on the racetrack. And one of the things that they tell us is um, it's very distinct needs and wants that they have during the course of a week. So you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is where we get to talk more about driver lifestyles, the backstories that fans want to know about, you know, try to get inside the helmet um, and have them learn a little bit about a little bit more about the drivers and what makes them tick. On the personal side. On the personal side. But we know that come Thursday, Friday, when that action shifts to the track, those fans want to know about competition, how the car is, strategy. Um, and obviously, there's a little bit of difference between our core fans. They want to know much more. Um, you know, I think like all of us, the, the core fan wants the stats, wants that inside look. Um, but even the casual fans want to know into a race weekend what they can expect, what they should see on the track, what the rivalries might be. So there's a pretty distinct shift for us midweek that shifts to the weekend um, that really gets into some of the deeper understanding of the sport and what's going to happen that weekend. Interesting. So c can you talk to a little, <coughs> a little bit about how NASCAR has stepped up its game recently with some recent campaigns like the Ready, Set, Race campaign or the hashtag 500, which was wildly successful? Yeah, so you mentioned you know, the, the split between digital and social. And, and for us, we know that the core fan is really very focused on um, our digital sites, our digital products, and social is, is much more um, snackable, is I think the, the term that we've been using. Um, but we did a campaign, you know, about 18 months ago, we, we did a distinct shift from a traditional television campaign um, to digital and social first. So we'll always have um, 30 second spots. We have great TV partners in Fox and NBC um, that we you know, provide content and, and back and forth. But we went the digital and social first strategy um, and really talked about driving our fans to our digital and social channels and then had kind of the television campaign um, as an overlay to that. So we did a promotion uh, called the Hashtag 500, no relation to Hashtag Sports, um, where we drove uh, fans to social media during the broadcast. So it was a nice um, cross-pollinization of those fans that were watching our broadcast on Fox 
uh, but we also encourage them to follow the race on Twitter and during uh, live racing action, they could tweet and whoever would tweet the fastest in this particular promotion uh, would win prizes from that, uh, from that race. So, you know, crumpled up piece of sheet metal if you were the, f the 500th person to tweet during the race, which the Fox broadcasters promoted during the broadcast, um, the fans were engaged through that promotional concept. So a really good uh, way for us to drive the television audience, but also keep our fans engaged on social as well. Interesting. So, so bridging on the, the array of ages from the audience that we're trying to capture from a fan engagement standpoint, I have a question for you, Alfredo, regarding the attention span of millennials. So I'll, let, I'll, I'll start with a little story of my own. So I have a 16-year-old son, and we were watching. He's a big basketball fan. So watching the NBA Finals a few weeks back, and we were out shopping for some stuff. And it was like 8 o'clock. And I was like, hey, we got to get going. We got to get back for the tip-off. <coughs> and he was like, dad, it's fine. You know, we'll, we'll watch it. We can re rewind it. And I was like, we are not going to rewind it. Um, and so we got there, and we were home for the tip-off, and he's sitting right next to me, and he's not even looking at the screen. And five minutes into the game, Durant makes this awesome dunk, and the broadcasters are going crazy, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, you missed that. And he's like, well, we'll rewind it. I'm like, no, I'm not going to rewind it. You should have been watching from the beginning. Um, Tough dad. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he's sitting right next to me on his five-inch screen versus a 60-inch screen. And five minutes later, he's like, oh, wow, that was an awesome dunk. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so uh, his, the intention span of, of even something that he is deeply engaged in, he's a, he loves basketball, loves all the statistics around it, I still can't get him to like put the device down and just watch it with me without any interruptions. Like, it's just impossible. Yeah. And the fact that he's so spoiled that he can, or his mentality is that we can just rewind it without having to sit there and pay attention is like, it's tough for me to, to handle <laughs> personally. So how, how do you deal with um, millennials just having that, they don't need to be at the start of a soccer game. They don't need to be watching that great play right at that moment. It's yeah. okay for them to watch the game an hour later, a day later. Like, how, how does that, how do you I mean, it, it's, it's a great challenge. I mean, and, and I think it's a challenge for, for all of us. Uh, millennials are gonna be almost 40% of the uh, global population in 2020, and they consume more than one hour in social media. And it's how to engage with that audience that it is not that focused in the live uh, content. And basically, it's, I think we should think on, on uh, what's the kind of content and how they consume that content. When, when they want to watch it, how they want to watch it, which platforms. Uh, uh, we had some examples in terms of uh, TV production. We invest a lot in La Liga to have a better traditional broadcasting production, and we realized that when you go to social or to mobile consumption, they don't care that much if that quality is that high. They want that specific moment in the, in, in the, in the most uh, accurate moment related to, to, to the live game. So, Trying to adapt the narratives and build, build stories that engage that audience is, is the great challenge uh, for us. It, it starts by better knowing our audience. Do, do you see the trend line continuing from a, from a mobile and digital consumption for your sport specifically, or has it been staying the same? Like, what has been the trend for, for soccer in general? Or I mean, I see the trend, the trend line come, uh, growing. Uh, we've seen in, in our uh, video consumption in, in the digital platforms, it, it increased in the, in the recent years. Uh, it didn't damage uh, so far to our TV rating, which, which so far are, are, are good, but we've seen how news, are, uh, news consumption changed in the, in the recent five years, how the uh, music uh, industry consumption changed. So we think that will happen to sports, and we will need to adapt our narratives and our content production to, to the new platforms. So you've, La Liga has recently entered into a partnership with Microsoft um, to help some, with some digital transformation and address some of these uh, challenges that you guys are facing. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on what your plans are from a technology standpoint or transformational standpoint? Yep. Basically, the, the main goal of these partnerships is to help us to better know our audience, to know which are our fans, and to have like a one 
unique vision of, of La Liga fans, track what they are, their interaction within the multiple uh, touch points that we have with them, whether our, our apps, our social media or gaming uh, platforms, uh, have a better uh, profiling identification of, of those fans and being able to together with business intelligence and analytics to providing the most relevant content and product and services, uh, not just from La Liga, from the 42 teams that uh, uh, form uh, the competition, not just as, as, uh, as a governing body, as, as a group of teams, and provide being able to keep that uh, information and to share with the teams uh, uh, that, that information and those strategies. So the, so the teams are also pushing you for, yeah. for assistance there? Yeah. Right. So they're, they're willing to make that investment yep. to help grow yep. their... We, we, we want to work closely with them to get them on, on board on, on that project and, and to uh, reach uh, and to broaden the reach and not just for, for a local competition in Spain, but uh, globally. Let's talk a little bit further about uh, a different type of engagement versus, you know, we've been talking about social and digital up until now, um, regarding fan engagement, regarding in, in venue versus out of venue. So just to make a clarity statement here, nobody on this panel, Major League Baseball doesn't own a stadium. NASCAR doesn't own a racetrack. La Liga doesn't own a stadium, right? Um, so it's not like they have a personal vested interest in making the experience in the stadium as best it can be. It's that they need to, right? So these are all governing bodies um, from a perspective of the sport. And that proposes a different challenge of what they view fan engagement to be and what their re requirements and responsibilities are. So for Noah and Alfredo, how is engaging fans in the venue different from how you try to engage them outside of the venue? That doesn't necessarily mean on the couch, like at home, but it can, obviously. Or outside when they're traveling or when they're in a college dorm or there's definitely differences there. I would love to hear your perspective on your strategies? We've, you know, we've invested a lot over the past few years in our technology at the stadiums. I mean, if you think about it, go back five years ago, you, know, you walked into a venue the size of a baseball stadium or any of our venues, you, know, you would have connectivity issues, you know, you'd basically be you know, without access to your phone and information for a, you know, a period of time, and that's really unacceptable in today's environment. So really for us, it started with um, league-wide, we went and wired every park, so we, we partnered with all the usual suspects, and we made sure that the technology within the stadiums you know, gave you the ability to be able to pick up your phone or any device that you happen to be with you and connect with the outside world. You know, I mean, forget for us, but for our kids, you know, it's, it's not having their phone, it's like not having air. So you know, we, we didn't want you to be able to No pun up. intended. No pun intended. <laughs> um, you know, so that was really the first step. Then the second step for us was, you, know, you look at these venues, and there was one person buying, you know, on average for us, three and a half tickets to an event. You knew who the person buying the ticket was, but you didn't know who was coming with them. I mean, we couldn't have known less about our fans, and that really is unacceptable in today's environment as well. So, you know, what we've done is uh, we've created an app called the Ballpark app that our teams use, and within that app, you know, that's where you manage your tickets, that's where you can forward tickets to other people. You know, that's increasingly how you enter a stadium with the mobile tickets, and that has allowed us to really understand the customers that are coming to the park, how many times they're coming, what other parks they're doing, combine that with some of the information we're getting through our other platforms, and then ultimately the goal is to have a much more personalized experience when you're in that venue. Certainly you can send something out and say, you know, hey, there's a, you know, a sale over here, or get, you know, get a beer over here, but you don't want you know, 40,000 people heading in one direction, so it really does become more one-to-one, -one. and getting that information was really the foundation of, of us um, achieving that, and it's still a work in pro or progress, but you know, that's, that's where we're headed. Yeah, in, in La, La Liga, we've been investing a lot in the match experience itself during, during the last uh, years. We didn't have like a unified TV production, and we had some some issues in terms of, of the facilities and th through connectivity, no Wi-Fi Wi-Fi access, and so on. So, for the last two years, we've been working together with the teams and get all this sorted out, like having a, a standard quality for for the grass that is essential to to play the to play the game having a uh, unified TV production, uh, connectivity improvements, but also it's also important for us uh, uh, the rest of the days between, uh, between matches. Guys at MLB, you have basically day-to-day day -day, uh, activity, but in La Liga we have seven days between, or, or at least three between games, so keeping the fans engaged in between matches is uh, such as an important thing as, uh, during, the match, during the match day. 
Do you think, and this is questions for any, anyone, do you think fans are expecting that kind of, so MLB was one of the pioneers of using beacons in the stadium and stuff. Do you think fans are, have an expectation now that, you know, when I walk through the rotunda at City Field that I get greeted and you know who I am, or do you think it's more of a um, big brother thing and they're kind of, they don't want to share where they are type of thing? Uh, so, you know, some do and some don't. And I think that that's why there has to be sort of a process for people to opt in. I mean, certainly when you're calling somebody out for being in a certain place at a certain time, that, that's creepy um, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, some people want it. And if you raise your hand and that's what you want, you need to be able to give them what they want. But you know, you, you really, the idea, I guess, is to enhance their experience and not really push them in one direction or another. So you take Beacons, for example. If you happen to walk by a place in the stadium or a certain part of the park that has you know, historical significance or something that they you know, may, may or may not know, you know, providing that information is kind of cool. It's a service versus you know, we did, you know, we did uh, early on say, hey, welcome to the park. You know, like that's something that we've sort of shied away from as you move forward. So it is trial and error. But, um, I think you do have to be careful and strike that right balance. And how, how involved are, I guess, the venue owners? And again, this is for anybody. Like, did the teams come to you, bam, and say, "Hey, you know, we're looking to do this with our fans," and you take their input, and it's just either hard to implement or too costly to implement versus what the fans really want to experience. I think a couple of different things. I think that when we look at you know, whether it was wiring the ballparks or otherwise. I think the goal of, of MLB.com from way back when was to make sure if you're a fan of a small market club that you had the same experience as something but from a large market club. So just because you're in Kansas City doesn't mean you should be treated any differently or any, have any less technology deployed in your stadium than, you know, if you were in New York. So the idea was, you know, we've taken a more central role when it comes to technology and delivering that. With the ballpark app in particular, I think the key to that is making sure that for us that our clubs can customize it and it can be their own. And that's, you know, so we've built the, you know, the sort of the core functionality that exists in it, but each of the teams, you know, customizes it. And, the, you know, the app, when you open it, knows what stadium you're in, and it provides an experience that's, that's a little different at every place. Some people might have in-seat ordering, other stadiums might not for different logistical reasons. So, you know, but they need to, you know, each venue is different. Fans from different parts of the country expect different things, but um, you need to make sure that it can be localized on a local level to make it authentic. Great. Question for you, Matt, regarding um, female viewers. So since your sport um, obviously is focused on female athletes, how do you view the, the competition for those viewers on the weekend? Yeah, um, I, think, I think what you'd probably find first is we actually in some markets skew much more even between male and female, uh, particularly outside the United States and parts of Europe. You know, for us, what we realize is our star players, uh, they index so well across fashion, travel, cultural, political issues in, in some cases. Uh, and we really want to draft off that, not to use a NASCAR term. But what we want to make sure of is that, you know, we're still in the early stages in well some done. regards. Right, of the, uh, thank you. Uh, we're in the early stages of our digital social transformation. And what we know is that linear television continues, it's, it's critical for us, of course, but it continues to grow pretty steadily. What we're finding is, is actually the digital consumption of our matches and our sport, uh, it's doubled in the last three years. And what we want to make sure that we're doing, because we're global and, and we don't have you know, anything but a one or two week window of time at particular uh, geographies, that's where we're really pushing in the last year to make sure that the social and uh, digital products help take the fan on tour. Um, and so we're really trying to take advantage of, you know, to a certain extent, our players' uh, images, their likenesses, their behavior. You know, the first two or three days of a tournament is really uh, heavy in aggregating the content from the players as they're available before really their matches start. Uh, and what we've really uh, worked on is short form content. And we're finding it incredibly helpful, both male and female. You know, our Facebook views are up 500% year over year. Twitter's up 800%. And we've increased our overall social audience by uh, 62% uh, just in the last 18 months. Right? So what we're finding in the early stages is you have to have a complementary telling the stories and whether it's male, female, whether it's different preferences or whatnot, uh, where people are from uh, in 32 countries, you really have to be um, you know, a good tactician, but you have to also be strategic and most of all you have to listen to the fans. And when they want you to sort of go down a different path, your curation uh, process has to adjust. So like NASCAR, you, 
you know, you, you typically follow a driver in NASCAR, right? And yeah. since tennis is not a team sport, is that the same where you, the folks have a thirst to, to understand yeah. what they do off the court or in their personal lives? And does that drive? Yeah, I think, I think we are tennis by nature uh, in many cases is a regional sport. Right, so although we have maybe 10 or 20, if you're an avid tennis fan, maybe you could name 10 or 20 fans. But what really happens is it's uh, the German populace, they want to know how the top five to 10 German players are doing. In the UK, it's the same. In China, with Li Na a couple years ago, I mean, it was the most watched CCTV sporting event, uh, you know, when she's in a Grand Slam final. We have to be able to adapt and take advantage of those. It's obviously a challenge from a time zone standpoint, and that's why we've really doubled down uh, with WTA Networks and our, our thought process on really trying to be able to customize as much as possible content. It might be captured at the same moment, but the way it's edited down, the way it's overlaid with music, sound effects, et cetera, uh, can kind of uh, focus on different countries appropriately. So building on that a little bit, Jill, if you can give us a, your perspective on, so NASCAR has, been, has had a continuously growing female population and their viewership in your Latin communities have grown as well. Can you tell us how that, is that different from what Matt just mentioned regarding his strategy? Yeah, I think a little bit for us. I mean, we've always, you know, probably uh, might be surprising to some some folks, but, you know, we've always had a, a pretty much of a 60-40 split between a male and female audience. Um, and that stayed consistent over time. You know, a lot of the elements that are true to our brand um, resonate with the female fan base as well, but we don't have a dedicated female strategy. You know, we're going to go after um, you know moms in this market or, or young females in another market. We know that the things that NASCAR fans want are pretty ubiquitous across male female audiences and across demographics as well. They want to be inside the helmet. They want competition. Um, they want the intense, passionate racing. They want crashes and, and excitement. Um, I would argue that, that women are no less competitive than men. So they want, the, our fans want the same thing. Um, so we deliver that to them. And we've actually seen the way we're delivering it through digital and social, that that 40% kind of of our general audience split is actually you know, a little more evenly balanced. You know, almost you know, 45 to 50% of our followers on social media are female. So um, you know, I think it goes again, along with the themes that we've heard today, it's customization. And whether it's a male fan, a female fan, a Hispanic fan, they want when they, what they want, when they want it, and the platform um, you know, that they're consuming at that time. So all of us have the challenge to deliver that, um, you know, that, that thirst for customization and, and uh, the delivery mechanism that is most convenient for the fan. We all have to try to deliver against that. So we don't target female, male. We do some things um, in the different demos, but um, male and female, it's, it's pretty standard across the board. So Noah, to her point there regarding the personalization, it seems to be a common theme on the whole panel. Um, there used to be this, you know, the term second screen. Um, I don't know if that's relevant anymore. It's almost like the tablet has now become the third screen and the TV is either maybe not a screen at all or uh, a sometimes screen and the focus is the primary screen is your phone. Um, how do you, how has your strategy changed there from a second screen, quote unquote, perspective and keeping that personalization. Sure. I mean, for us, it was always the first screen. And, and I think when you look at it now, you know, used to customize based on you know, age group and demographic. And now, increasingly, it's really by device. So if you take a, take a look at the iPhone, or any phone for that matter, you know, we see roughly at MLB, we see roughly seven minutes a day that somebody spends on their phone um, consuming us on that device. So what do they want? What are they coming for? Used to be back in the day, you know, you'd make somebody click five times to get to a score or to get to where they want. You know, you have to be respectful of their time. With the seven minutes they give you, what do they want? So we put scores front and center. We put highlights front and center. We allow you to customize that experience. You know, we have a condensed game where you can watch the whole game in 10 to 15 minutes versus you know watching, um, you know, watching a full game. And if you come on your phone that's probably something that should be more front and center. So we really look at the device now. You take a look at connected devices, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we get a roughly 45 minutes on average there. So 
you know, that's a different experience. And with that experience, it's, you know, you want to, it's more of a lean back experience, but at the same time, you know, there are people that want more information. You know, it used to be just about the strike zone and, you know, what, what's hot, what's not, and where did it land? And, you know, you used to say it's a 93 mile an hour fastball, but that doesn't even tell the story because a 93 mile an hour fastball can get hit if it's not moving. You know, now it's really dimensionalizing the stats and showing the movement of the ball. So, you know, and there's people that want that information. And so, you know, while on a phone, that might be something that's hard for for us to bring you know, front and center on the connected devices is something that you can overlay easily and provide. So you know, we really now look at device more than we look at by demographic. So are all those things additional, those, those additional overlays as you refer to them, um, the, the strike zone, the trailing path of the sure. ball, the trajectory, you know, how fast this outfielder ran to get that ball and all that kind of thing, are those things that fans were clamoring for that you guys introduced to or is it a function of the fact that you have the most um, games of sure. a season, right? So there's, there's, there's so much that the fans can take in from baseball, baseball also being a sport that has traditionally been a statistic heavy sport. Um, is, that, is that part of the strategy of you know, how much can we overlay here and how much is too much versus, hey, this is what the fans are asking for? Right, I think, I think, it's, I think it's both. I think there's a segment of the fans that are asking for it. You know? And again, more, you know, if you take a look at it, there's different stats that you'll see coming out, but we can basically tell now if somebody's on first base based on who's pitching, who's catching, the lead they're taking. You know, we can have something there that overlays on the field that say, you know, there's a 90% chance if he runs from here that he's gonna make it to second before. You know, there's more and more, it's just contextual. Does everybody want it? Maybe not. <laughs> But um, increasingly, people want to sort of understand what's going on and why, why so-and-so hit this, why they run, you know, and understanding the game more, I think, you know, can make you a better fan. Um, but that said, some people don't want it. Some people just want to lean back. So it really, it really just depends. It really just depends. Yeah, I mean, I get the privilege at Microsoft at working with a lot of our sports uh, partnerships. And two of the questions I get asked a lot, uh, most often are, you know, if, you, if Microsoft can help us solve who ticket number two, three, and four is, like that's the holy grail, because nobody's done that yet. And the second is, you know, how, how can you help us be more contextual and more relevant? So that example, for, to, be, to clarify a little further, is if I'm attending a New York Knicks game, and you know I'm attending a New York Knicks game, like don't offer me something to go purchase merchandise for the New York Rangers. <clears throat> or even worse, not being relevant. That's, so that's an example of not being relevant, but not being contextual where if I'm already at the game and you know I'm at the game because I'm tweeting or I'm doing something, don't offer me a discount for parking after I park my car. Like that's very frustrating for a fan. However, it's super um, beneficial to know that information from a league or team standpoint. So like how, how much is too much? Like I guess, from, and this is for anybody, not, not directed at anyone specifically, but how much is too much about reaching out to a fan? No, do you want them to say, hey, I'm here, WTA, I'm here in NASCAR, you know, send me stuff, or I don't want you to know that I'm here, don't send me anything, <laughs> I just want to tweet on my own. Like, wh what's, the, what's the balance there? I mean, that's not an easy question, and there's no right answer, but I'd just love to hear it. It's hard not to listen to the fans, whatever they're, you know, we're, we're still at the point where we're segmenting and trying to understand. Um, you know, even the last two years, we've come to learn actually our average age is two or three years less than we thought it was, right? As we're going into different uh, modes, different platforms of, of viewing tennis. So, you know, we're, we're still at the point where we're heavy listening and adapting and, and trying, you know, customizing, but making sure you're okay failing a little bit if it's moving you, uh, moving you forward. I think there's too much, there's never too much for us. You know, we have to educate um, our, a lot of our fans, particularly moving casual fans, to be more avid on the strategy, the, um, you know, what is happening at the racetrack, whether you're in the venue, really important for us. There's a lot of noise. We have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so providing data or some explanation and some background on what's happening at the track through your device is really helpful for us. You can look at a scoring tower, it's hard to know what's happening. We can obviously do that uh, much better through the broadcast or through um, NASCAR.com and our products, but that data and what's happening and the things that Microsoft has helped us with is taking all of that and making that fan understanding much deeper, which keeps them coming back. Mm -hmm. We're not using it as much to, 
to send them to you know buy another um, beer, or another mm -hmm. Coca Cola. We're just we want to, them to understand and, and to know more about the sport. So I think a little bit um, you know similar to Matt is that we want to make sure that it's enhancing their understanding of the competition. So Matt, in tennis, you have different logistical challenges than NASCAR does. So in NASCAR, we're talking about a vast space, typically in remote locations, not usually in metropolitan areas because the, the net impedes on connectivity. Tennis is different where there's simultaneous matches going on. And you're, if you're a fan of more than so if you're that German scenario, if you're a fan of more than one German uh, tennis player that's, that's happening at the same time, like how do you be on this court and understand what's happening on the other court. Like, yeah. those are some of the challenges that you're facing. How do you no, deal that, with those? No, that's right. I, you know, I, I think what we have, uh, not only do we not own the venues, the venues are in use for, you know, typically two to three weeks around a tournament. Uh, some of the larger stadiums are a little more year-round. Uh, Indian Wells out in California is a great example, owned by Larry Ellison. You know, they're putting in uh, technology to try to make the fan experience as much as you know, analogous to going to a major sports league. Um, but it really is for us, you know, we have potentially, at some uh, tournaments we have 16 to 24 uh, matches going on different courts at the same time. So how do you tie it together, right? It's, uh, and I think of the analogy with golf, right? And, and what Microsoft's doing with the PGA Tours is very similar to what we're looking to do, where, you know, so I'm on court seven and I'm watching my favorite German player, uh, but I hear uh, a lot of noise bubbling from court number nine. What's happening? And I can look, and, and that's where we have to get much more advanced in the connectivity, but also just a simple, how are we telling the quick story or creating the platform uh, so that the fans can really look and say, okay, although I'm on court seven, I know this is going to the third set on court nine between two top 20 players, I'm gonna walk over there, right? And that's what we have to move towards. You know, it's just, uh, it, it certainly is a challenge, but not, not insurmountable, right? Just have to focus on it along with our members. <laughs> um, does the term, so this is going towards now some more of the out, outside of the venue specific mm -hmm. scenarios. Love to hear your, your reaction to the term cord cutter. Does that scare you? Do you hate that term? Do you embrace that term? What does cord cutter mean? Well, I was, I was probably scared of the cord cutter until I became one, right? So I haven't, had, I haven't had cable in about a year and a half. And yes, it's difficult without sports. Sometimes you have to work a little bit harder. Um, you know, but the reality is that you know, people that are uh, choosing to get their entertainment through different uh, channels, vehicles, platforms, uh, they're going to do that. And no entertainment or, or brand is necessarily going to stop them. Um, you know, what we're finding is as they're viewing on alternate platforms, it's helping us overall with the, um, uh, with the relevance of the WTA. And uh, so we're fine with it, right? Uh, I, and I think, you know, it's like anything. You know, 50 years ago, there were fears of this technology, this technology, this technology, when cable started, right? So now it's just a different paradigm that we have to work within. It makes it more difficult. It makes it more of a challenge when you're extrapolating that by 35 countries. Uh, but, you know, what we're trying to do is take it in digestible bits. And uh, what we're really learning is that, you know, to the talk of linear earlier a bit is um, we can work with the linear broadcasters and illustrate that the, um, the fans that are uh, cord cutters, you know, they never knew them before. They never had information or data from a traditional linear side. So if we can work through partnerships, and we're actively doing this, uh, with the broadcasters and alternate channels, the, you know, the, the digital side, uh, we're able to actually go back and provide the broadcasters meaningful information. So there's, you know, there's a whole question about whether it's cannibalization or you're building up overall relevance. I think, I think our mindset is, you know, the pie is this big. Let's, let's really make sure that the pie is as, uh, as large as we can get it before we start worrying about cannibalization, right? Jill, did you want to comment on NASCAR? Yeah, I think, you know, you could be afraid of, core, of the term core cutters. It's not going to do you any good. Don't be afraid. It's, yes. Don't be afraid. <laughs> um, it's here, and I think you know one of the byproducts of that. It's forced us to look at the way we present our sport with our broadcast partners and make sure that we're providing what the fans want. So you know, live sports is is a product that is very compelling, and, and um, you know I think that is best suited to adjust to to all of these changes. But you know, to Matt's point, the other screens, the other opportunities, 
Um, that just allows us to present it differently, to present it in a way that attracts those younger audiences that we were going to lose anyway. If you're not going to innovate, um, then they're not going to come. They weren't going to come to us. So I think it's forced a lot of the f a lot of us in this business to look at how we present things a little bit differently and take <clears throat> advantage of it and, and have it be complementary versus something that is a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. I do think it's going to call into question, you know, talking about the traditionalists and, and tennis is very traditional in the media side. So trying to advance, you know, away from sort of a bit of an overbearing reporting, you know, this is our three or our five set match and that's it. You know, talking about presenting a five minute match, a 10 minute match, you know, in different contexts, I, I think that certainly has to be the future, right? And whether people are going to AVOD, SVOD, or whatnot on the streaming side, you want to be able to cure it in the way that they'll watch, right? My 10 or 15 year old daughter, they're, they're not necessarily going to watch a uh, two or three hour tennis match, but boy, they'll watch a 25 minute or definitely a 10 minute, especially if I ask nicely, right? If you ask your kids nicely. Uh, <laughs> so snackable. Snackable, right? And so then you could argue that, well, you're gaining a fan or attention that you otherwise would have uh, never had. Mm -hmm. so. So I'm going to end this with a last question for all four of you, if you can give a brief um, answer regarding your opinion on the deals that are happening now that the Amazons and Netflix and Hulus and Twitters of the world are shopping for, um, uh, yeah. the, the deals with the NFL and some other deals that these, these media companies or social companies are going out and looking for these big media deals. Like, what, what is everybody's opinion on that? Is, that? is that just a trend? Is that going to continue? Is it something you guys are entertaining? Well, don't want to wait, talk about? has anyone else been approached by these companies? <laughs> is that right? Yeah. But it, it, there's no doubt it's happening, right? Of course it's happening. And, and as the uh, as this search for uh, credible and quality content, you know, it's, it's a, it be, does, does become a bit of a bidding proposition, right? Um, certain, so it's here to stay and, and probably will continue to accelerate. The real question will be, you know, what's the whole contextual um, experience for the viewer, right? Because in those new or non-traditional platforms, are they going to be able to, like, really create the whole uh, ecosystem of, of data, stats, behind the scenes, et cetera, or is it just going to be streaming matches? Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting challenge. We're ready to watch it. I mean, I would say, listen, there's, there's, there's enough to go around. I mean, if you look at baseball in particular, you know, we play every day for six months. You know, right now we're doing a Friday night game on Facebook, and we're, you know, we're learning probably just as Facebook's learning. And, you know, the question is, does, is that content make sense for that platform at that time? And, you know, I think the, you know, we'll find out. But certainly content's still king, and when it comes to sports and those of us on this stage, it's really one of the things that's very tough to time shift. And so as a result, you know, it's, uh, it's valuable. It's valuable to platforms, it's valuable to partners, it's value, certainly valuable to advertisers. So just making sure that you're capturing those eyeballs in the right place at the right time still allows you to monetize it in the way that uh, you, know, you want to. Interesting you say time shift. Is it, is it less flexible than linear broadcast? Or is it just it depends on the strings that are attached? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it just depends. It, for us, it's geographical. I mean, you know, we, again, we right. play every day. So once tonight's game's over, you know, you're on to the next day. So, you know, and you're on to the next game. You know, that said, if you're overseas or you're displaced like that, you know, you might want to wake up and really watch the game. You might watch the mm -hmm. condensed game. You might watch the whole game. So it's a little different for that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, for us, it's, it's, it's just really hard to time shift. You know, no one game, unless it's the playoffs or the World Series or the All-Star game, no one game has enough meaning that you need. You know, you'd go back like mm -hmm. All right. We are over a little bit. So I want to thank everybody for making the trip, yeah. even if you had to take a subway. Um, <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.